Howard had the chance to see the other night what I thought was a very powerful message in a video essay that you delivered uh, that aired on TNT during the NBA playoffs. And you did something that I thought was different than any other uh, journalist of your stature that I'd seen in terms of addressing racism. You spoke directly to a different audience this time. You directly addressed white America. Why the decision to do that? Thanks, Dexter. Um, well, it, it was fairly straightforward from my standpoint as terms of, in terms of how I wanted to attack this video or to structure this essay. We had the opportunity, several of us at, at BR Mag, to work with TNT on this new show, The Arena. And there have been video essays by a variety of people. I think Jamel Hill had the first one. And when that offer was extended, it was, listen, this is a show that is going to combine both basketball and social issues. And, and, and that could take on anything. That's the, the pandemic, the racial unrest, and uh, racial justice. It could, you could take it any direction you wanted to, really. But the, the thing that kept coming back to me when I thought about things that I might want to express. And this is, this is a different forum, a different um, venue for, for me to, to explore. I don't, I don't do this often um, or ever usually. Um, and so I kept thinking about the jersey messages and how people had just kind of become numb to, to the messages in the backs of the jerseys and that there were a few that really struck me. The, the ones that I named in the essay, listen to us, hear us, respect us, and I kept coming back to this thought, which was in the essay, which was that's directed at a specific audience. Like black people don't have to tell the black people, hey, listen to us about these issues that we're talking about. Like, you know, like, that's not that's not the discussion that needs to happen. It, the discussion that needs to happen is for the broader uh, population, which is basically the white population to listen. And it, that if you are not if, if you don't get it, if wherever you are on the don't get it spectrum, whether you are having an actual uh, backlash to this, whether you're, you're reacting negatively to it, like I don't get this Black Lives Matter movement, or I don't understand what the, the issue is here, or um, whatever it may be. When NBA players are bringing this to the forefront and speaking on it every night, maybe you don't get it. Maybe you do have a, a, a negative reaction. And, and my thought kept coming back to we're never going to solve this we are never going to get these issues resolved or addressed at the level that they need to if white america isn't on board because that is still the majority of the population and of course white america white people in general not you know there's not any specific person you're talking to but it's like generations of white people structured the systems that have created these inequities and these injustices and so it is up to white people to fix it. And I kept coming back to that. And having, having had these conversations with friends for a long time, and as somebody who, who feels like I, I'm, I, I tried to be in tune with these things, I, 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 I do think I get it. Um, what is my responsibility? And I think my responsibility at a time like this is to talk to other people who maybe are still trying to come to grips with it. And, and I'll say this too, be, be, uh, just a long-winded response, but I've been inspired by several of the people that I cover in this league, uh, notably Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich, Stan Van Gundy. You know, these are white coaches who, even before George Floyd, even before this current wave, these were guys who were comfortably out front addressing these issues, especially Pop and Steve Kerr, and, and, and saying it from the perspective of a, a, a white person in America who, who says like, I, you know, I get where my privilege is and I understand what black people are going through because they work with black players every day in a league that is 80% black. Like they, nobody had to explain it. They, un, they, they get it. And so having heard them use that, that voice and that platform and their voice and their platform is a little bigger than mine, but having seen and heard them uh, do that repeatedly and, and boldly, and Kyle Korver's essay in the Players' Tribune a year or so ago, that that really resonated with me, Dex. That that they were being, um, you know, as 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 strong an ally as they could individually. And I thought, if this is an opportunity for me to weigh in, in a way that I normally wouldn't publicly. Again, these are conversations I might have one to one. Um, so I, I had to, you know, I had to be prepared to to you know, for what it would feel like to, to say this to a broader audience. Um, 
but I thought that this was an opportunity to do that and, and one that I, I definitely wanted to take. I was glad that you brought up the white coaches in the, in the NBA and also as for yourself as a white writer in the league that you said is players 80% black um, in this. You, you've seen the inspiration and got the inspiration from those white coaches, Steve Kerr, Popovich, as you mentioned. But I also have to think, <clears throat> excuse me, that you also probably have seen people who don't get it that are white. And that had to be part of the inspiration to also share this this message. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing. If, if everybody agreed on this, we wouldn't need to, to you know, beat anybody over the over the head with these these uh, issues or, or with these concerns. Um, yeah, I listen. It's been heartening to me that in the wake of George Floyd, when the streets were filled, not only here in New York, but all across the country and around the world, that this was a movement that, at least in my lifetime, I had not seen at this level. And all the statistics and the polling suggested that um, two things. One, many, many more people in this country embrace, em, embrace the, the concept of Black Lives Matter. Forget the organization with capital B, capital M, L, capital M, but the, the Black Lives Matter movement Far more people, especially white people, were embracing that now than eight months ago, a year ago, five years ago, seven years ago, when, when that movement really started to, to take hold. So that was encouraging. And then on top of that, there was polling suggesting that this was the biggest movement, biggest protest movement, the, most number, you know, the biggest number of people ever in the U.S. And, um, and, of, and of course, that's not everybody. That's that's a lot of people and it's more people than we've seen before. And that's where the encouraging part comes. More people agree on this and are participating and, and are, are trying to act, be actively involved in, in moving forward and in, in, in finally uh, uh, trying to resolve these issues. And so that was all great. But, yes, there are plenty of people out there who and there, there are people who are violently opposed to this. Right. I mean, violently in the, in the figurative sense and sometimes sometimes in the literal sense. And they're, they're not reachable. The, the racists are not reachable. The ignorant people are not reachable. Um, the people who want to, to uh, dismiss this movement for any number of reasons, both real and concocted, they're not reachable. I do think there is a middle there somewhere. I also think there are people who might be sympathetic to it but are not quite um, – they, maybe they don't think it's their issue, right? They, they might understand it intuitively. They might have read about – any number of, of these incidents, Ahmed Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, Jacob Blake, you know, or going all the way back to Trayvon Martin, or obviously we could go decades and decades before that. They may understand it. They may empathize. They still might not understand where the responsibility is. And the responsibility is, of course, with all of us, all Americans, all people. But as I say, I do think that white Americans have a special responsibility here because this this is a country where we are still you know the the majority of people and it was our you know predecessors um, directly or indirectly who who created these systems and so yeah I it, if it moved anybody if it if it got anybody to kind of just pay attention for a minute um, I thought that was important the other thing I'll just say real quick is this yeah. I, I, it's the it's the part at, at the end of the essay when I said look it's not enough to just to be a fan of these players like that was a note I really wanted to hit because. If, if you're not acting, if you're not, if you're not either, whether you're, you're um, how do I put this? You, you may agree with some of the messaging regarding Black Lives Matter and still not be embracing it or actively uh, working on it yourself. And, and everybody's got their own way of supporting a cause. But what was really important to me is that if you are, if you are somehow still compartmentalizing this as a white fan who's rooting for these teams and rooting for these players and saying, yeah, that's my guy and you're buying his jersey, and you're cheering, and you're buying season tickets and all this stuff, but then you draw the line and say, eh, I don't want to hear about this other stuff. Then you're not respecting their humanity. You're not respecting them as individuals, as people, and you're not really a fan at all then. You're, 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 you, know, you love the entertainment, and then you're deciding, but they're not actually people that I, that I have to consider beyond what they do for me. Like, that's, that's really crappy. <laughs> Um, and I, and, and that definitely that, you know, that, that line definitely exists for some people. And those are the people I think maybe are the main target or the, the main aim of, of my essay, which is you, you can't be a fan of this league, this 80% black league and not listen to what black players are trying to tell you about what's affecting them, their families and their communities. 
I completely agree with that, Howard. Um, and the messages, you talked about the messages on the jersey that have, that have been out there throughout the NBA playoffs. I think to some degree there are some people who feel that it's it's become a bit, you know, performative with, with, with the kneeling. We, we've seen the message. You said, you also said earlier, people may have grown tired of this. And I think that's why it was so important to hear your message directly addressing an audience that sort of, that may have been, you know, I- ignoring this. Um, there, there kind of has been a, a disconnect. At the end of this essay, you said to white people, we can act. What do you, what does that mean to you? Or wh- explain, expound on that further about how white people can actually act in the situation. I know you talked a little about listening and hearing, but what more do you feel like white people can do to use their voices and, and amplify their voices in this situation? Yeah. Um, that one's a little more difficult only in that, you know, I never want to be in a position of trying to tell people what to do. And I was trying to strike the right balance in that essay of, of, of being uh, instructive without being preachy. <laughs> I, I hope I accomplished that. I hope it didn't sound too preachy to, to other white folks. Um, but maybe that's what it takes too. I don't know. Um, I, I think act can be as, as, as simple as listening. The, the li- listening is acting. That's part of it. Understand this. Sympathize with it. Don't be actively opposing the, um, the the movement itself because this is too important to to be standing in the way. But acting, yeah, could you know also mean everything from going out and and joining in a march or a protest, especially on, on a day like today where obviously we're you know less than 24 hours removed from the grand jury and uh, in, in Kentucky not indicting the officers in the Breonna Taylor case. Um, so there's a lot going on today, and and there will continue to be. It could be marching. It could be donating to certain social justice causes. It could be just educating yourself. It could be you know. There's a long list. I think if if, if you if you Google um, you know uh, I, I can't remember the exact list, but there's a list of basically you know like uh, you know white you know education for white people looking to to get up to speed on social justice in this country and also civil rights in this country because there's a lot that people I think still don't know. Our, our public school system doesn't do a good enough job of educating us on, on some of these key moments. Um, so there's, you know, there are, I think it's resources for white people, I think was the, the list that is out there. Um, so th- those are some of the actions people can take, but also it, it's, you know, it's voting, it's paying attention to whether the, you know, what the, the district attorney or attorney general running for office in your locale is, is standing on and whether they believe that we need police reform. Um, it, it, it could be, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, and you know, I, it's, I'm sure there's, like I say, there's a laundry list we could get into, right. but I think if people, if people are, are really interested in helping, they'll figure it out. What was the process of doing this? Because you're usually in the space and, and medium of, of, of writing out just either, either to print or to, to be online. Um, that's kind of been, you know, the, where you've, you've existed, but now to be in front of the camera, and have to deliver this in a way that, you know, TNT wanted this to be shown. What was that like in knowing that you had to get the message out a little bit differently than you normally do? Yeah, definitely different. Um, look, I'm a, I'm a writer by trade and I spent, you know, decades in newspapers where my face and my voice were not seen and heard at all. I was, you know, simply just, you know, uh, you know almost anonymous behind a byline. Um Having been at Bleacher Report for seven years, where especially when I first got there, we did a ton of video. I did get used to just on camera presentation, got a little better, not great, but better at, at doing this, at, at speaking into a camera and, and presenting in a way that that was um, effective. And so that part of it, you know, the writing the essay, I think, was the almost the easy part. Um, you know, obviously it took some time, but I knew, I knew what I wanted to say. I, I, I knew the, the major, major points that I wanted to hit. And then, um, I sent that over to the producers in Atlanta. They, they liked what they saw. They had a, a couple of, of minor suggestions, nothing serious, tweaked it a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, they set us up. There's a, uh, studio space that is like a converted basement in an old church in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And so I uh, went over there one afternoon, and they had a crew set up, all these cameras, and um, just uh, – it was, it was a really interesting set. I mean, you saw it. It's just this it, – it, like, it looks like an old abandoned warehouse, but with a basketball net mounted. And um, 
they uh, they put my my essay onto a teleprompter. I've never used a teleprompter before. Um, a lot of the essay had I was pretty well ingrained in my head anyway, but it was great that I did not have to memorize a full three and a half minute presentation. Um, so yeah, it was it was interesting an interesting process to go through. What have people been saying to you about this video? Has it's kind of gone viral? It's been far more positive than I than I expected, Dex. I mean, I you know, so on an issue like this, you brace yourself for the worst. And especially on social media, because we know how toxic that can be there. And I've seen plenty of it over the years. Um, I'd say it was 80, 85 percent positive. And yes, the usual, you know, you know, jerks, racists, ignorant people, crazy people, bots, whatever, you know, did come out. And um, I blocked them as quickly as I saw them. Um, I have zero tolerance for that stuff. And maybe because I've been blocking those accounts for so long, there weren't that many left to scream at me. Um, but it, it really was, uh, the, the vast majority of the responses on, on Twitter, on Facebook and otherwise have been positive. And again, that to me is really encouraging. You, you don't, you just don't know how people are going to respond and what to expect. And, um, you know, you know, when you're, you're, you're always looking at a time like this for, for signs of encouragement. You know, it's easy for us to all get very cynical about, yeah, we've seen these movements come and go, and we've seen other times when we thought we we're going to turn the corner on this issue or others related to it, and then it, it kind of peters out. And so um, uh, me trying to, to always find the, the optimism at a, at a time like this, when optimism has been hard to come by in this country, I am very encouraged by how overwhelming that the positive response to it was. And, you know, Twitter's largely anonymous. We don't know who these people are really responding and how many of them are who they appear to be, how many of them are anonymous, everything else. But um, I think that's a good sign. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad to see that it resonated with, with more people than not. With everything that's been going on, obviously in the bubble, we talked about the, the slogans, names on the back of the jersey, uh, the player strike that took place in the, in the first round. All the things we've seen a lot of action by by players and now you've sort of had a, a call to action uh towards the white community in this country um with other voices like yourself coming into the fold um and i think it is important for for white voices and so it's not just on you know hey the black players or the black people have to end racism in this country right in this fight against systemic racism are you encouraged that a video message essay like you did here can amplify other voices to, you know, call others to act, to, to listen, to do more. It, it, you talked about being encouraged, but do you think what you did kind of can push this forward a little bit? I don't know that any one person pushes this forward, right? It takes, it really does take everybody. Um, and, you know, I, I think for each of us, you, you play the part you, that you can play. If someone's going to give me the platform for, you know, three and a half minutes on national TV to, uh, bring my own message to this. Yeah, I'm going to take advantage of it, and I'm going to hope that that makes some small dent also. But I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't expect, and I'm not egotistical enough to believe that my my message or any one person's message is going to be the, you know, the message that pushes this forward. I think, you know, you know, major uh, props to NBA players for being willing to to take this on and to continue to push this forward, and to the NBA for giving them the the, the platform to amplify it and to, and, and for embracing it because that was, there was some, some risk for the NBA in, in doing that. And I know, listen, again, the cynicism comes into play. Oh, this is now branded and this is now commoditized or corporatized. But the more this message becomes mainstream, then the more it's comfortable for other Americans, especially white Americans to, to, to kind of join the movement or to at least, you know, nod their assent and say, okay, yeah, I get it. Um, and, and at a minimum, not stand in the way, if not actively get involved. So whether it's my message, whether it's NBA players, whether it's this league, whether it's entertainers, and, you know, everybody who has a platform, I think it's our responsibility to try to use it in a way that continues to amplify this and push it forward with various different audiences, in my case, the wide, audi wide audience. Um, and, and, and that's that's how we get where we want to go. That's how we finally, hopefully, fix some of these these uh, social injustices that we've been dealing with since the inception of this country. And um, I, 
you know, look, I, I, I'm not smart enough to know how exactly we get there, wherever there is. I do know enough about history to know that most of these things, most progress is very incremental. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, arc of history bending toward justice, all that, but it, it, it takes a while. Um, but, you know, listen, wh whatever small part I can play that any of us can play, we have to. I, I just, I, as I said again in, in the essay, it's, it's our moral obligation. Um, so I, I'm you know, grateful to TNT for, for giving me that opportunity. Uh, grateful to everybody who worked on it because it, it, it took a lot of people putting that thing together and, and it would, the, the, the production value, the, the, um, footage they used, the score, everything was just fantastic. They did an incredible job. So, um, you know, my thanks to all of them for, for making that thing come to life. Absolutely. Salute to them. I agree with you. It's, it's, it's not, at this time, none of us uh, can be silent um, in the fight against systemic racism. And as I told you, I appreciate your voice on this. I appreciate you as an ally. I, I've said it publicly on Twitter. I've, I've texted you. I've told you uh, the same. Really appreciate your voice in this. And I, I just hope that you're able to continue the work you're doing, all of us as journalists, uh, to do the same. That's Howard Beck. Uh, you can check out his work. Uh, would be our Mag Bleacher Report and also the host of the Full 48 Podcast. Howard, thank you for joining me, man. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Dex. Appreciate you, man.